Okay. Uh, good evening uh, from London. Uh, welcome everybody um, to this evening's Rhino user group meeting. We have um, uh, a couple of presentations for you, but first of all, I'll just say that I'm uh, Paul from Simply Rhino. We're the UK suppliers of Rhino software and um, training, and we also organize these, uh, these meetings. Um, now, if any of you, occasionally people have sound issues. If you do, please type that into the chat and we'll do what we can to help you with that. They're normally easily resolved. Um, for questions as we go uh, through this evening or uh, the next hour and a half, do type those questions for the either panelists or for us into the chat window and we'll read them out live to either the team from Astimer or from McNeil. Um, I just want to also say that this, this is being recorded as usual and it will be posted on our YouTube channel as soon as we can after, the, after we've finished. Um, so now I just want to introduce the, the first presentation is going to be from the team from Astimer, including Carsten and Alex. Um, they're going to present a project um, called Aura, which is uh, an all electric concept car. Um, and they're going to show us their, their, their workflow um, and, and we're going to discuss some of that. And then we're going to hear from Scott uh, and Kyle from McNeil, who's going to, I think, dive into, well, Scott, do you, could you tell us a little bit about what the presentation is going to show us a little later? Today, oh, well, we're going to go into the nuts and bolts of sub D and uh, what's new in Rhino 7 and maybe how to approach um, some models and uh, really um, hopefully get our hands dirty a little bit trying to work with some Ds there. Excellent, okay. Um, and we also have um, Phil here, who's one of the senior instructors at Simply Rhino. Phil's just gonna help with some, some questions and uh, keeping everything moving along nicely. So uh, I'm gonna hand over now to um, Alex, I believe he's going to, or is it Carsten who's going to do the next, the very next bit? Is it Alex? I think uh, I'll control the screen. Carsten, Carsten will present the first part. I see. Okay. So, so we'll see you for questions after the presentation. Great. Well, um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Carsten Astheimer, and um, from from the the Astimer design team here, um, as as Paul was saying, there might be some sound issues. Now we're we're, we're in our studio here, and there happens to be a rainstorm at this present moment. We got a metal roof, so excuse uh, excuse us for that. I'm afraid we can't control what happens from the heaven. Um, so today we're going to go through, as as Paul said, a, a project of ours uh, called Aura. Um, it's it's a it's a partly funded project by the Niche Vehicle Network and the OLEV, the Department for of of uh, Low Emission Vehicles, um, funded by the UK government. And uh, we've we've been developing this with with a number of of partners, leaders in their in their fields, and uh, and Alex will be going and and explaining the um, our process, our digital process through de the development phase of the the project. The project we're just starting the build process now, so very much a, a topical live project for us. Um, First of all, I'd just like to um, say a little bit about who we are here at Astimer Design. We've been going 10 years now, and uh, we are fully now fully focused on designing mobility solutions for a sustainable future. So we're automotive focused, um, and we we design and develop vehicles of, of all nature, um, principally in the automotive field. Um, very much like the project that we'll be showing you today, which is a, a sports car. Uh, we work with, um, with with commercial vehicles, agricultural vehicles, 
We've worked with vertical takeoff vehicles and and marine work as well. So really a broad range of uh, mobility um, solutions. And uh, but our work actually goes goes beyond that as well. Um, so long as it's a good fit for us, uh, we, we we have and as you'll see on that page there, some of the the the, the brands that we work with. Mars Group, for example. So we develop pretty much all of their molds for their chocolate. So we develop the concept, the form, and the molds for the chocolate. I know it's just chocolate, but it's quite an involved piece of modeling work. And and pretty much with all of those clients, whether it's Bentley, Nissan, the Volta truck that we've just done, ProDrive, uh, you know, high performance engineering company, we use Rhino as our primary tool um of modeling and and it serves us it serves us exceptionally well so just on to the next slide please alex so about what we do then um we work with our clients um right from the beginning phase of understanding the needs of of the 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 needs of our client what they're looking to develop understanding the user and the use case um the, the positioning the 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 product within the competitor market set understanding the technologies and resources that we can use the brand identity and really being very sure that we're pinpointing exactly where the where the project should be developed um the exploration phase of course pushing the boundaries um the design ideation cast development um, and we're using all the latest tools there to to really visual visualize and validate our designs whether it's virtual reality um, and and I think the aura project that that Alex will go through will clearly demonstrate that process and then through to the execution so we've, we've got um we're up here Alex and I are up here in the studio below we have a, a workshop uh, on the right there, you'll see an image of our workshop. We have a six meter milling machine. We've got various 3D printers, etc. And that's where we assemble, or we, we develop uh, mock-ups and, and, uh, and prototypes. And we can build up to a road legal um, prototype level, which Aura will be. Um, so it's a, it is a really end-to-end -end design process. All the way from a positioning through the exploration to to a, a functional prototype at the end of the at the end of the process. Um, right, so that's very much who we are, um, what we do, and and this is a great example of the end-to-end -end design process. Uh, and just the last thing from me, um, you'll see the four partners that we've we've been working with, um, Potenza is has been uh, developing and making the drivetrain battery battery management systems conjure is developing the hmi system so the, the user interface the what goes on on in the screen and how that interfaces with the with the vehicle and bammed uh, is is making the um, the natural fiber composite material parts for the vehicle so lightweight it's a fantastic material it's lightweight it's very flexible very durable um, so suits this vehicle completely right so over to you alex and um yes how we have gone about developing this exciting concept designed for nature uh yeah just sustainability that's core and efficiency driving its design Great. Thank you very much, Carson, for that instruction. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Alex Stewart. I'm the Senior Design Engineer here at the Asama Design Studio. And uh, on this project, I've been acting as Program Manager across the consortium. So, yeah, what we have in front of us, this is the first view that we're releasing uh, to the public of the, the Aura concept. This is CGI for the moment, but the vehicle is in build downstairs. Um, it is an all-electric concept car, as we see written here, designed for nature with sustainability at its core and efficiency driving its design. So it's the real showcase of what a consortium of, of 
leading British businesses can do in the development of a zero emissions vehicle. And of course, helped along by funding from the Niche Vehicle Network, uh, which is receiving their money from the Office of Zero Emissions Vehicle now. They've uh, since rebranded since we started this project so to be more aggressive in their pursuit of a more sustainable future. So, first of all, we're going to focus on a, a little bit of a design. We are a design studio, so we, we do take a lot of pride in uh, the surfacing, the styling, you know, the, the story behind everything that we design, you know, making sure that everything we do has a purpose. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly showcase some of the some of the sketch work that's been done by my colleague uh, Tom Strong, who's acted as senior designer on this program. Um, but really, the the first core words that we, we've used to kind of drive the design is is written here. We've got we want to capture natural purity. We want to capture a digital vibrance that showcases the advanced technologies that we've got hidden under the skin of this vehicle. And we really want to showcase the sustainable sourcing aspect of this. You know, we're using around the vehicle some quite innovative natural reed composites, which are uh, much more sustainable uh, than the likes of a glass fiber, for example, uh, and has uh, a performance quality somewhere between glass fiber and carbon fiber. And we have that visible on the exterior of the vehicle. So that's quite exciting. So as of every good design project, we start with some really beautiful sketches, you know, getting the pens and paper out and getting ideas down on paper. We've got a lot of constraints that we had to work to. So we had a predefined chassis that has come from a donor vehicle. Uh, we had uh, significant budgetary constraints that led us to certain critical design decisions like can we afford you know, to cast new glass for a windshield, for example, something that we would have to homologate to be able to drive this legally on the road. Uh, we, we decided it, that wasn't possible. So we've gone for a, an open top land glider, effectively, this very long, low, sleek vehicle that's gonna glide through the, the landscape, all electric, completely silent. It's gonna be a wind in your hair experience, very visceral, very exciting. So you can see that captured in some of these sketches you know, also to say, Alex, uh, extreme time constraint as well. Extreme time constraint, yeah. I mean, what we're looking at today is a, a six-month project from putting pen to paper to having a vehicle built and ready to drive on the road. So a significant challenge for everyone involved, especially considering uh, the backdrop that we've had uh, on the global scale with the pandemic. So... Yeah, as you can see, you know, we work through our sketch phase. Uh, you know, we have design engineering happening concurrently when we do our design work. So we're constantly feeding in new constraints, new understandings, uh, new specifications for um, parts of a vehicle that we have to go out and procure uh, and we can't custom make. So the sketches reach a level of fidelity where we can start diving into details, adding technical detailing. Uh, we've used Grasshopper throughout uh, to do some parametric work, some some simple patination on some of the surfaces that reflect some of the um, CFD aerodynamic work that we've done on the vehicle. Uh, and we, we get to add these nuggets of design around in carefully, you know, around the vehicle. Uh, and, you know, we set aside enough budget so that we can, you know, really give the car these little bits of jewellery that, that kind of emphasise the technology that lies underneath it. So here's one of the one of the later sketches where uh, you get to see we've we've got some innovative things going on. We've got a, a circular display on the steering wheel, for example, a, a five-inch LCD uh, that acts as the cluster. Something that's uh, we don't think has been done before. Certainly not circular. It's self-leveling as well. There's a sensor on the steering rack that uh, helps us understand what the the steering angle is and we automatically compensate as you turn the wheel. Uh, we, we turn the UI to to correct itself. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a little bit of a, a showcase of the design process. But of course, that's that's only a very small part of the story. You know, we we pride ourselves on being a studio that can provide you with a, an end-to-end -end, um, turnkey service to design and build a working, fully functioning vehicle of any type of any size. Um, we've got extensive experience among the team. Uh, from automotive, from marine, uh, from commercial vehicles. 
uh, and we have a, a proven track record of developing uh, electric vehicles. Uh, most recently with the Volta program, uh, which we, we built a, a 16 ton electric truck, all electric truck, one of the first in its weight category, uh, which is now being taken around Europe on a, on a showcase as Volta, the company, uh, builds up to production. So in six months, how do we go from you know design work like we've just seen, very conceptual sketching, to a, a real vehicle? Well, we, like I've already said, we've faced a, a few significant challenges. Uh, one is budget. This is a, uh, a partly self-funded program. It's partly funded by the government. Uh, but ourselves and our partners have been stringent in keeping the cost down uh, and using this as a as a capability showcase for everybody involved to highlight on a non-confidential project, because most of our projects usually have to stay confidential, uh, to showcase what the studio is capable of doing. So we've had two people working on this for the most part over six months, and that leads us to needing a, a very multi-talented team. So everybody in the studio is, is versed in our digital development process, which kind of, I break down into two halves. We have design surfacing, which is the translation of that um, sketch intent, uh, the translation of all the values that we've uh, built into the project, uh, which on this particular one is, you know, focused around sustainability and efficiency and reconnecting with nature. Um, that's that's all the translation there. And then the design engineering, which is taking those translations, which usually results in you know an A surface model uh, and good visualization, and then ensuring that throughout the design engineering process, none of that 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 beauty, that form, that function is lost as we go and start checking against our engineering packages, uh, checking and, and integrating our partners' systems, our own systems that we develop in-house, uh, for example. The headlights there they're all done in-house including the electronics um, you know building all these extremely complicated things um, into the vehicle card and then having a sign of process where we can deliver things uh, out into production and then build the car for real so on the design surfacing side i've just written down just a, a few bullet points of the kind of things we get involved with um, computer-aided styling uh, you know we're all uh, have to be experts in that to work here. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We do that in subdivisional very early on. We use the new sub D tools to kind of form find, especially over uh, a mechanical package that we might not be familiar with. It's it's useful to to use sub D to quickly iterate in in that regard. Uh, we quite quickly then jump into NURB surfacing, which of course Rhino is, is built around. Uh, and we use that uh, to start refining surfaces, uh, having des regular design reviews before we then have an A surface lockdown and we'll go into class A and we'll go in and we'll smooth out all the kinks. We'll make sure all the surfaces meet the manufacturing requirements uh, for uh, surface quality. Uh, and then we also add in our uh, parametric detailing if we have any on the vehicle at this point. So we jump into Grasshopper and you know build these algorithms that can make surface patination and then of course we visualize all that uh, using uh, in our case on this project we use v-ray for our ray tracing and we use autodesk v-red uh, to do our vr reviews and then on the design engineering side oh there's just there's just so much to talk about um these are just some highlights we we do parametric kinematics which we'll give you a demo of in a short moment um, we do cfd aerodynamics uh, we have some great partners who provide us with cfd compute power uh, we run all our uh, iterations of our a surfaces through cfd to make sure we're optimizing it in the, the correct way uh, in this case we're doing it for uh, to minimize drag to increase the efficiency and range of the vehicle uh, build strategy and park breakup, you know, one of those things that will make or break a build. You have to get that right to bring everything into cost. Uh, B-side engineering, again, it it's it's quite it's quite challenging to create, you know, a beautiful A surface, but it's it's another challenge again to to get on the B side of that uh, panel and design in all the engineering features you need for it to clip together like Lego when it comes to the build. And then all sorts of packaging requirements for uh, partner supplied tools. So now I'm gonna jump into a live showcase. So hopefully this will work. 
I'm going to jump across and straight into Rhino, where hopefully you can see the whole vehicle. So Rhino was our, our main tool in automotive. You, there are a lot of people use Autodesk Alias, and you know we're proficient in that as well. But we find on a small project like this, albeit not small, but a small car, something that's uh, a very rapid timeline, um, we need speed and flexibility. And that is something that Rhino awards us with. So we have and are capable of building an entire vehicle entirely in Rhino. And that's not just design surfaces, that's all the engineering card, that's everything down to uh, you know, individual resistors on PCBs. We we model it all, we space claim it all. Um, and with a powerful enough computer like I happen to have right here, uh, we can have that all in a single model tree, uh, well organized, and um, that makes our data management very efficient. So here we can see an example of um, our surfacing. This is the final um, CAD model that, that's gone to production. So we've got these these very big panels that we've worked very hard to uh, develop the surfacing on. Um, Rhino is a, is a great tool for, for NURBS. You know, a lot of uh, automotive firms specifically ask for alias because they don't understand that other tools can achieve class A surfaces, uh, but of course they can. Um, in Rhino, it might be a little more involved. You might have to know a little bit more about uh, what you're doing. Um, there aren't as many uh, tools to kind of help you along the way, but it is certainly capable of it. And, you know, this is a, a showcase that we can achieve, you know, really quite beautiful surfacing um, with, you know, what is a, a really great tool at our disposal in, in having Rhino. So in a, in a CAD model like this, you know, we have everything. So if I just, for example, pop, pop the bonnet off, um, and of course, let it auto save, um, you'll see that we've got an, an enormous amount of engineering detail built directly into these models. So eventually, here it goes, there it is. So one thing that we we are definitely not is we, we don't do vanity projects, you know, we we love automotive styling, but you know, we're not just skin deep, we go down, we go under the skin and we develop all the sub assemblies, we support the engineering, uh, our engineering partners in specifying an, an initial design for chassis modifications. Uh, and this piece, uh, for example, this is a large glass fiber piece, uh, which helps come up from bridge up from what is quite a narrow chassis from our donor vehicle and up to the bodywork. And pieces like this involve an enormous amount of constraints. It's a molded part, so we have to take into account draft angle, uh, minimum radii, um, part size that we can fit it on uh, the various milling machines that are available to us. And that kind of process needs to be undertaken for every single um, part of a car, every single piece. So this is a, you know, probably about four months of work we can see here to get to a complete vehicle to a manufacturable, fully engineered uh, level of design and uh, using mixed processes as well. So we're not just using the same design rules for every part, you know, if we just isolate one piece here, for example, this is milled from solid ABS. So it requires, you know, a lot more detail on the B side, which again, because it's being milled by a machine, it has to comply with minimum radii, uh, minimum feature sizes, etc. So that's a, a, a quick showcase of how we, can build an entire car in the Rhino ecosystem um, and keep the entire assembly available uh, so that any one of our team can jump in and access the, the bit that they need um, without having to you know dig through hundreds of files. And just to highlight that a little bit more, you know this is the center console um, for the screen. So it's a, it's a touch screen. We've got some illuminated buttons uh, and we have some some controls at the bottom. But what I, I'm really uh, keen to show you on this piece is that, you know, in our model, we go significantly further than just um, the, the mechanical elements. You know, we go in and we check for connector ingress. We check, um, you know, we build in connectors. We build in all the PCB assemblies. Um, I'm sure you can see here, there's an enormous amount of complexity and we work with our partners who need to package 
their electronics. Uh, so in this case, Conjure, who are developing the UI for the screens, they have a, a screen package. Um, you know, we work with them to package them within our own assemblies. So we get control over the, the industrial design of a piece, um, but we can also go in there and we can make sure that we're, we're doing all the right um, electrical packaging. Uh, we even go as far as, as designing some of our, of our own PCBs to enable uh, the design to to reach manufacturer in you know the vision that we we had for it. So in this case, we wanted this specific button layout at the bottom, nice anodized buttons. Um, so we went out of our way to uh, design a PCB. We can see a space claim for that here. It's this piece at the bottom, uh, and then we'll go into our um, PCB routing software and we will go and actually route the circuitry for for this piece of equipment. So yeah, you can see that you know designing a car is an enormous task when you have to go down to this level of detail and when you start with a blank piece of paper uh, and you're only a, a small team uh, you know this is the level of fidelity that you need to reach to be able to make something you know roadworthy uh, to make it uh, pass the test that we need to be able to drive it and test it and you know far from this being a show car this vehicle is actually a test article. You know, it will be taken on long range runs to test the battery technology that our partners at Potenza have built into the vehicle. And that means that the vehicle needs to be robust in every way. And even something as small as a, a, a switch on, on, a, on a screen like this needs to be engineered so that it meets our safety cases. So we don't have any um, failure points when that vehicle goes out and hits the road and is experiencing vibration and wind and weather and all these all these attributes that make um, car design such a such a complex topic. So steering away from the complexities a little bit, I'm just going to jump into uh, VRED. So throughout the design process, we have to validate um, both our surfacing, our design decisions. Uh, and also uh, fit and finish conditions, tolerances, shut lines, things like that. And uh, generally we use the analytical tools like uh, I've just been showing you Rhino with uh, analytical render enabled. Um, but when we wanna walk around it, you, we take it into Autodesk VRED, uh, which we use primarily so that we can use our HTC Vive behind me uh, and we can walk around the vehicle and review it at a one-to-one -one scale. So, here you can see, I'll just swing around. What you're looking at here is actually a mock-up of our workshop space. So we took the time to digitally measure and model our workshop space that we have downstairs. And uh, we review all our vehicles at one-to-one -one scale positioned in our virtual workshop. Um, this has a number of benefits. You know, This allows us to you know, really get a, trans uh, a true scale for the vehicle, because sometimes when you view things in VR without some context in there, it's really difficult to understand the true size of something. Um, it also helps us with logistical things, you know, where are we gonna put the car in here when we build it? You know, we've got all these panels, where are we gonna put them when they're not on, already assembled onto the vehicle? You know, can we can we turn it around in this space? When we have multiple projects, can we, can we shuffle them around and uh, not get in each other's way? Uh, so that's, that's something that we, um, like to review in our virtual space and getting into vr in this space is is really good because you really can't design a vehicle without jumping into vr everything looks completely different to when you look at it on a screen in rhino and i look at rhino a lot so i find it a real treat when i jump into vr i get to walk around the design and you suddenly gain this fresh perspective that that you you see things in new light, you see details that you, that you hadn't realized would turn out that way. And it, it really does enrich the design of a development process. And we make sure that throughout a program, we put the vehicle into a virtual reality and review it at a regular cadence, sometimes once a day, so that the designers, everyone working on the project can, can really appreciate and, and get a sense of, of scale and complexity for the assemblies or for the, for the surfaces that they're working on. And eventually you get to the point where you have you know, a complete CAD model. This is almost complete. This isn't actually our latest, but this is very near to complete, um, where you get to see some superb detail. And if you're working with a client, uh, 
this is where you can really get people to buy in. You know, if this vehicle is going to cost you know millions to get into production, then this is right at the start when you need to get people in, excited. You can bring investors in, show them the vehicle at one-to-one -one scale before you go and build a prototype and really get them excited, really get them to, to sign on, get them to give the okay and uh, confidently move towards production. And talking of that, you know, one of the other things we use VR for is, is production style checks. So we're making a one-off prototype uh, in this case, but there is still an enormous amount of complexities in the assembly process. We design things in a specific way so that we can take it apart to access things like the powertrain, the battery management, uh, you know, service the electronics as and when it needs to. And we have a hierarchy of, of service layers that we build into the assembly of your vehicle. Um, and when we have it in, in a virtual reality space like this, um, this allows us to, to take panels off. It allows us to run clipping planes through the model, check fixtures, fittings, make sure we're not experiencing any clashes during assembly or, or when it's when it's fully assembled. Um, yeah, a really worthwhile tool to use is VR. So then the last thing I want to touch on uh, just for a couple of minutes is our use of Grasshopper. So here at the studio, we've been using Grasshopper for best part of five years now. And we've used it very successfully to do uh, mostly surface patination for OEM clients. So we've, we've done, for example, the knurling for uh, Bentley, uh, the new Bentley, I think it's for Flying Spur it ended up going into. Uh, we do all the knurling around the vents. That's all something that's parametrically defined uh, with Grasshopper. Uh, and uh, we've also done it for the likes of Nissan, working with their interior teams on a couple of uh, show vehicles, high profile show vehicles. Uh, doing some really interesting stuff with um, patination that we then go and uh, laser cut out of upholsteries and have laid upholstery. Really exciting stuff going on there. But Grasshopper as a tool, uh, as a plugin into Rhino, has an enormous amount of functionality that um, we love to, to use day to day in the studio. And that goes literally for any any function that you can think of that you might do in Rhino, it can be parameterized in Grasshopper. and and you know, if it was any other piece of software, you'd probably call uh, Grasshopper like a, a, a system of macros. You know, you can build these little scripts up that automate something for you. Um, and that doesn't just have to be surface generation like we see, um, you know, promoted with these beautiful um, cellular structures, for example, that you might see people develop using Grasshopper. Um, so in this case, we wanted to showcase something a little bit different. Um, on this program, we use Grasshoppers uh, not just to do patination, we have some patination on the vehicle across the, the top surfaces, um, but we actually used it to do kinematic modeling. So you can see here, we've got a, a mixed uh, mixed model here. We've got some scan data that we uh, collected and we've got some of our chassis modifications which have been bolted on. Um, and when it comes to designing bodywork for a car, you need to have a very good understanding of the mechanical package that you're, you're building over the top of. Um, and unfortunately, due to you know the backdrop with the pandemic and um, everyone's uh, the difficulty with having resource, the access to the real vehicle was limited. Access to our sites was limited. You know, a lot of us were working from home, and uh, we actually experienced a little bit of um, a reduction in staff. Uh, one of our partners, and they weren't able to give us a kinematic model that we required to be able to confidently release our body surfaces. So we actually went in, and all the wireframe that we see here is a custom grasshopper code. I'll just give you a quick screen grab. There's, this is my grasshopper script. And we have every attribute of the vehicle suspension um, programmed into grasshopper that we can change on the fly. And, you know, this isn't just for fun, although it is great fun to get the sliders and twist things about. What this is really doing is when we switch our bodywork on and throughout development, we go into here and we go, okay, when we turn our wheel, we reach maximum lock and we hit a curb and we go to maps, maximum suspension compression. You know, do we hit our panel? You know, how much do we have to eat away of the wheel arch so that we can clear all these edge case, you know, usage scenarios? And you know, this allows us to, especially when we're building it off of scan data, our kinematic model. 
this allows us to confidently move ahead with our design decisions and put some key surfaces in place that we we can't go beyond uh, and develop you know what is developed to the absolute maximum of margins that we can attain with our mechanical package and hopefully uh, build something really beautiful so i think uh, we're probably at the end of our time so i'll, I'll wrap it up there um, but it's uh, really exciting to um, to show you the, the car uh, and all its complexities. A, a small snapshot here of the part breakdown and all the parts we've developed. Um, yeah, and I I'm, I'm, uh, hope that the build process will go smoothly over the next month and uh, hopefully you'll see some live video of it uh, when it goes to range testing at the end of the year. Great, yeah, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, just, uh, you know, Compliments to you and, and obviously to Tom for, for all the amazing amount of hard work that you guys have done in six months to get to get a, a vehicle like this completed and built. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Great presentation. Um, I'm just gonna change it, show my screen. Okay, so at this time questions very welcome there are, i've got a few questions for you um just to repeat uh from earlier for for both sets of you know panelists and presenters you know questions uh and discussion is very welcome you know it's pro probably one of the most um valuable parts of the um of the event so you know as many questions for for astimer and for mcneil you know all very welcome so first question here um, question from Chris. I guess I'll just address them to either of you, Alex or Carsten. But um, so, uh, why not use a windscreen from an existing vehicle? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll answer that one. Um, yes, you can do that. We we looked into that. Um, it it compromised our, our design theme uh, to to a certain extent and uh you also it needs to be yes it needs to be eu marked um it requires structure and then it requires windscreen wiper washers uh to make it legal as well so that these were you know somewhat the 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 straws that broke our our budget uh of our camel's back so um we we had we had to draw a line somewhere um, and pretty early on, that was that was a, a line where we decided, right, we're not going to go down that, we're, we won't go down that route. So you'll have seen on the car it has wind deflectors. So we've tested those in CFD. Uh, so we're relatively relatively sure that those will will deflect the air around the the head of the driver or the or the passenger. But yeah, that was just a decision on budget really, more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult to show you a, a complete vehicle in such a short time frame, but those wind deflectors, they have a, a slot in them and a wing profile. And as the air enters them, it's almost like the, the kind of a wing of a plane. It pulls the air up and it deflects it over the driver. But um, yeah, adding a, a windshield is, is not just about, you know, the glass itself, which obviously has a cost. Uh, and of course, you could use on, uh, someone else's, but it's for rollover protection. It's for the wash wipe capability that you then have to add into it as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we turn these things to our advantage when we have a constraint like that. You know, we want to make sure that it's a plus and not a negative. So one thing that we can do on this vehicle, which, again, I'm, I'm afraid we weren't able to show you, uh, but it is reconfigurable as a single seater. So we actually went out of our way because mm -hmm. of the windshield decision to design the roll hoops so that they are independent of each other so they can be removed. And we def designed it so that the front wind deflectors could be removed independently as well. And there's a there's a cowling, there's a cover that can go over and cover half a cockpit and you get significantly reduced drag for your long range uh, run if you're uh, configured as a single seater. So that's, that's something that we're implementing on this vehicle. Okay. Um, Steph, I don't know, is it possible to bring Scott back in? at this time it would be good if we could because the next question kind of uh yeah Here he is. okay thanks um alex and carsten uh this is a, a question uh from jonathan 
but I think it, it could it perhaps lead to some interesting discussion and maybe brings Phil in as well. Um, so from your point of view, particularly Alex, as the, the main user of the software, um, what would you like to see happen in Rhino in terms of improvements to surfacing tools? Um, I mean, this is actually a question posed by uh, one of the uh, attendees, but you know, it's, 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 it's uh, a question perhaps you'd perhaps like to ask uh, as well. But so um, uh, just mentioning, they also mentioned perhaps improved matching, blending, etc. cetera. Um, but perhaps this is something that uh, we could have a discussion about. Yeah, um, absolutely. What a great question. Um, how long have you got? <laughs> Every designer always wants more tools that work quicker and faster, and you know that that's just the nature of things. Um, Rhino is is excellent because it's so versatile. It's fast. It's lightweight. It's versatile. We can do everything we need to do in it. Um, it imposes very few constraints upon you. Uh, I came from, uh, before I used Rhino in the studio, I used SolidWorks and I had a parametric feature tree, which um, until you move to like a freeform surface modeler, you don't realize how suffocating that is. You know, you, you think it's parametric, you think you can go back to the start and change a key variable and everything will update perfectly and uh, it, it just doesn't. Um, so I found moving to Rhino very freeing. That being said, you know, for our industry where we're, um, you know, delivering parts into the automotive industry, uh, sometimes entire vehicles, um, surface quality is something that gets paid a lot of attention to. And um, like I said during the presentation, that is something that is is achievable in Rhino. You know, it, it uses all the same math. It's it's an herb space modeler. You know, you can go in and you can make it work. Um, but I think what uh, the likes of Autodesk Alias has to its advantage is it has a lot of very specific tools that are aimed at that very specific sector. You get you can get an automotive version of the software and it comes with tools that kind of automate some of those processes. Um, there's some interesting tools like, uh, for example, for upholstery, there's there's an auto stitcher, you know, it automatically takes two surfaces, makes a little a butt seam, adds those surfaces in, and then it adds stitches either side. And oh my goodness, if you've ever tried to model upholstery, that's, uh, that's a challenge. Um, but yeah, like you've already mentioned there, um, anything that helps achieve A-class surfacing in a simpler manner, uh, improve blend matching uh, tools, more analysis tools where you can um, check the deviations uh, across multiple surfaces and help tie them in together so you can reach that, that class A standard quicker, that any tool that can do that is, is always useful. And that's one of the reasons why in the studio, we always pick up the latest work in progress, Rhino. Um, we're, we're on the eighth one now, uh, and we always check to see, you know, these tools we rely on every day, you know, that we use a thousand times a day, you know, what are the little improvements that have been made to that, you know, how is that going to increase our workflow and, and help make, you know, executing our design visions that little bit easier. Oh. Okay, any uh, response to any of that, Scott or Phil? Oh, that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the I think the the I think that that idea of flexibility versus versus a, a very specific workflow that starts to put um, essentially puts limits on how you put things together. You know, a more technical understanding of how the surfaces are being put together and keeping them that way. I think that's. Uh, as Alex alluded to a little bit, it's possible to do those things in Rhino. It's just not its kind of default behavior. Um, you have to be careful that we don't refit something underneath you um, while you're doing it. And so, um, you know, that's that's always a, a big debate internally for us is, you know, we implement certain features, you know, how much how much restriction does that put on the the having exactly the right situation? To, to make the, the blend and match work perfectly, for instance. And so it's always been a really big internal struggle for us is to try to decide where where to put constraints on what you can and can't do. So, to, and, and we're always, you know, as usual, we always want to hear about it. We always want to know what people want. Um, we just have to sometimes pick and choose what we implement, but we always want the feedback. 
So Scott, before we, we were just chatting before you came online um, and uh, mentioning that some of the automotive OEMs are taking on Rhino and potentially developing it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. obviously as, as, as keen users, we're all keen to hear if those improvements get, you know, when we'll get to see them. You know, as soon as we can talk about, I mean, as soon as we can, we, you know, that if we find out, we can tell everybody. So, so, <laughs> no, we don't have a lot of secrets, but, but the, um, it is, we are seeing a lot more automotive OEMs take on the product. Um, and as, as you're doing with Grasshopper, um, and, and different companies are doing it at different levels, um, we are seeing a lot more development uh surrounding tools in rhino there um and 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 that's pretty cool uh and and so but but at this point you know what what we all know about is what we know about um yeah so so yeah but i i i agree that there's some some hope that 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 you know the that there might be some plugins or something that that may push in a in a very specific workflow direction when it comes to automotive i mean already uh, just to to already the 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 patternation that you talked about with grasshopper is is fairly widespread and um you know uh there's a lot of little pockets of grasshopper uh uh routines that you know maybe can become more public yeah because obviously as a, as a studio you know we 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 spend a lot of time there's there's such movement and there's such a variety and such choice in all the software um, that you know, we 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 do spend a lot of time and and an effort, you know, in looking at what's what's out there, what's new, and and deciding on what to what to invest in and train in and become good at is 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 a is is very strategic for for a design studio and and what we do and the software that we use. Um, uh, and so it's 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 really important for us. As a studio, to know that you know we're we're betting on the right horse, and uh, and the horse that we're betting on has got future and it's got legs to go the distance. Well, I I can say that 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 I I am actually more confident right now that that following Rhino and automotive is the right move than I have been in the past. You know because because it previously before before we had as much uh uptake with this tool in automotive you know before it was just a really an, an outlier and and i feel it's a lot less that way right now so hmm. so okay so, so and, it, and it catches our attention right exactly you know it's like oh there's there's more customers doing automotive you know maybe we should actually pay attention yeah, um, yeah. you know and that and that's really important but that that has been a big growth for us lately yeah and as alex said you know we we are um you know, it's the freedom that 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 Rhino gives you that is great. Uh, we don't want to lose that, um, and that's definitely a bonus on on top of some of the other maybe higher uh, surface quality softwares. But um, as well, because we work in 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 so many different sectors as well, we our focus is is purely on 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 mobility and sustainable mobility. But we also, you know design chocolate and mobile phones and sports equipment etc cetera, etc cetera, and assemblies and electronics and you know the kinematics of 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 a suspension so it you know it's 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 great to hear that that there is an investment going in that direction uh, that, that is an interesting point though actually casting because that, that's something that we hear from our clients a lot that people might not be aware of you know to, to work in automotive is is very desirable as a consultancy mm. and people will come to us to design something that is completely different like like the chocolate because mm. we work in automotive you know mm. actually if you take a piece of chocolate we design uh principally the, the galaxy range so if you take a, a a bar of galaxy chocolate and you actually stop and have a look at the the surfacing that's going on on that piece of chocolate it is a lot similar to Automotive design is very sculptural, very difficult to build blends. Uh, there's a lot more similarities in there than uh, than you'd expect. So yeah, it's definitely desirable to have you know these automotive 
um, style functions uh, built into Rhino. But you know, let's not be around Bush. You know, Rhino's Rhino's cheap. You know, on the grand scheme of things, compared to specialist automotive tools like uh, no, you no, get. Not cheap, not cheap, Alex. Don't tell, don't tell them it's cheap. Yeah, it's good. It's decent value. Decent. Yeah. <laughs> decent. <laughs> the, the others are just a ripoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, I think that I think that I, you know, we do price it. We do think it's important to price it so that it can be a complement to what you use, as opposed to you know having to choose between one and the other. Um, and and there are you know there there are other tools coming. You know, there's a a really nice high end um, CFD package coming in Rhino. Um, that's that's uh, you know uh, the Rhino Flow RT people. Are, are expanding their suite of tools that that are really really interesting and so some of these analysis tools on that end are going to get better um but yeah we we just like i said just keep giving us feedback and eventually we'll we'll actually get some of these things done i know people some of people have been asking for a long time i get it Okay. Yeah, the, 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 there are a couple of questions that we're always asked in training about tools, but maybe I'll leave those till yeah. till after Kyle's done I his so. thing. Maybe but. that'd yeah. be good, Phil. Thanks. I, I think there's there's one last question for Alex, just a slightly technical thing, and then we'll move straight on into the McNeil presentation, and then you know whatever questions there are at the end. But again, I just want to repeat for all the uh, the attendees, please keep the questions coming. You know, uh, anything for McNeil, they're very interested in having that discussion with you. The, your feedback is why they are here. So, uh, you know, to hear that feedback. So a um, question for you, Alex, just before we move on. Can you talk a little bit about your layer management approaches in Rhino? If we could keep that quite brief, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> this is one of those things where when you work in a team, everyone will have their own way of doing things. Some people just have loads of geometries everywhere. Some of people that kind of like to, to shift their iterations across by a known quantity and they just keep building their CAD models out like that. Um, I, I'm a fan of keeping everything in very stringent layers. Um, we, we have specific phases in our design process. So when we uh, jump into a Rhino model, <clears throat> our layer tree will have the client, name and we usually use uh, an abbreviation for, for most of the things in Malaya structure. So we'll have a, a client abbreviation, we'll have the uh, project, we'll then jump into the phase and then within that we'll have uh, a working layer and then within that we'll have a layer dedicated to every person who's on the team. So everyone will have their own <clears throat> initials in there and then that's kind of their working area. So when they jump into a file they can kind of dump all their stuff in there, they can organize things as they like. But when it comes to the main model tree, we keep things very strict. So we keep a, a golden master file that only one person accesses. And when we want to commit something into that file, uh, we will add it with a part code that aligns with uh, our bill of materials. So we'll have a full breakdown on an Excel spreadsheet of every part that's gonna go into the vehicle with its cost and materials and all, all that kind of metadata. Uh, and we will use exactly the same um, code, part code on that as the, the layer name. And, um, and that's basically how we manage to keep these massive assemblies organized. And then there's all sorts of other things that we'll have coming in uh, from outside the business as well, supplier CAD. So we'll have a supplier CAD folder. And then within that, I find it really, really important to date stamp everything. You know, if you get sent data, you might get sent the same thing three times with tiny little differences, and you don't know which, which version of geometry you're actually meant to be looking at. Having it imported and moving all that data from you know, however it's imported, if it's come from another piece of CAD software, moving it into a layer with date stamp, what it is, who it's come from, keep it nice and organized. And then there's always traceability. You always have the most up-to-date things. And of course, that golden master tree where all the final CAD for the vehicle remains locked, doesn't get touched, no damage. And that master file will stay on the server and uh, that, that's where we go from. We export directly from there to our step files to go to manufacturing. Excellent. Great answer. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Um, so 
we'll move on now. So Carsten and Alex, of course, as I mentioned, very welcome to stay with us for the conversations and questions at the end. Um, but now I'm going to hand over. So we should have um, Kyle with us as well. Are you there, Kyle? Yep. Yeah, Kyle's there. Great. OK, so I'm going to hand over now to uh, Scott and Kyle. And I'll see you at the at the end. But please keep those questions coming. I think um, I think I'm going to try to share my web webcam. I think I need to share. I think Stephanie's doing that. But do I need to share my screen here? There you go. Um, let me get the right, the correct screen. Okay, you should be seeing a car now, I guess. Um, yes, we do. Scott. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to take a few quick few minutes to talk about. We're going to talk about sub D, and Kyle's going to do most of this presentation. Uh, but I just want to 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 talk about what we did with Rhino 7. So Rhino 7, we we introduced a whole new geometry type. Um, and and rewritten from scratch and um, so it, they're they're sub d's and it's important to kind of take a look at some of these images about the types of models that you can do now in rhino things that you might not have tried um, in the past uh, one of the things that's really different with our sub d's is that they um, have a one-to-one -one correspondence to to uh, nerbs and so you can take your sub Ds, convert them to NURBS, and therefore you can get them fabricated. Um, our, our sub Ds aren't uh, refined meshes. They um, have a control, uh, a, a control grid, and then we go right to limit surface. And so we can edit in limit surface um, mode uh, with the way this works. Um, and, and you can see that the types of, of models uh, people are making um, these are uh, just some different ones uh, that we've seen, um, some of them by Kyle and, and some of them by others. Uh, but um, it just allows us to, allows people to actually design things now that, that, that previously would have been very, very hard uh, to do with NURBS. Um, and the nice part about these is, is that not only can you do the shapes, but you can actually edit them in this mode. You can edit them in you know, in their final shape. You don't have to explode them and pull them apart. And you can see we had a lot of design pieces there. Um, also, uh, jewelry is, is a place we're seeing a lot of movement with, with the sub D. And you can see too that, the, the, that it's not only the freeform shapes, but we're getting back to the decorative shapes, the, the shapes that, that many times had to be carved in the past. And, um, and some of those are due to the fact that, that sub D, uh, the sub D structure can be fairly arbitrary uh, in its shape. And Kyle will, will talk about that a little bit. This is Paul's work. Um, and um, you can see here that, that the detail can get very high and um, there's both the sharp edges and the soft edges. Um, and, and there's a lot of control um, that you can do. And again, this can be translated to a NURBS model if you'd like to, um, if you need to get it machined or something like that. Um, in addition to to the surfacing with sub D, we also have multi pipe, and multi pipe allows you to to have curves um, that are, for instance, out here, and then run multi pipe, and they actually create um, this tubing here uh, based on, and and all the edges will be, you know, the the edges will all um, essentially uh, meld together, um, so you get these really nice networks of curves that you can use. Uh, that's used a lot in in places where um, in architecture, in jewelry, um, anywhere where you need tubing to to all be you know one form, um, and we see that quite a bit. But that's called multi pipe. Um, the other thing that it's opened the the door for is soft goods now. So with the ability to do um, uh, these types of shapes with sub D's, we're seeing a lot more soft goods now come out of Rhino. In a, in a nice high level way. Um, more fashion uh, kind of work. This is a sub D model. 
um, based on on what it is. The other the and another thing with Rhino 7 that I'd like to point out here is these are Rhino 7 renderings. Um, the rendering engine is completely rewritten on cycles, and so it's allowing uh, people not only you know with the sub D to do the shapes, but you can also see that the rendering and the PBR materials and those things that we have are quite a bit better um, than what we've been able to do in the past. But this is um, some other sub D work uh, along with the rendering in Rhino 7. Um, we're not going to touch on rendering today very much, uh, just a little bit, but um, it's 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 an interesting, it really changes the dynamic, we think, in that you can uh, use the sub D to, to push and pull these forms in their final shape like this. Um, and continue to edit them in their in their final form and get the renderings right built into to Rhino uh, for your design renderings. Um, so that's what I have. I just want to um, and Kyle's going to take us through a tour of of actually creating sub D's. Um, and and the one thing I guess I, the other point I want to make is that it's very important that you approach sub D's differently than you've approached NURBS. It's a different kind of modeling technique. It's a different way to approach your your models, especially early on in the process. And so, um, I I would recommend taking time to figure out how to work with sub D's before you're in the heat of battle with the project. Um, and 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 Kyle will will lay out some strategies to that. So thank you. And and um, I'm going to pause here, stop sharing my screen, and Kyle can take over. Hi everybody. Uh, audio and video coming through. We yeah. don't have. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Great. So, um, what I want to talk about today is is basically the now I have sub D's. What do I do? Right. You somebody dropped a project on your desk. It's um, it's a sub D friendly form, meaning it's very organic, has lots of forms that blend in and out of each other and um, requires a, a high level of sculptural control, um, maybe uh, is a project that's gonna require a significant amount of iteration and form finding. And the, the project that I'm gonna talk about today is, a, is an automotive seat. And what you see on my screen right here is essentially just really quick scribbled lines over a seating package so that um, I know basically what kind of forms I need to be working within. And the only thing that you need to know about sub D's is drawing a single square. And what we're going to do to start with is I'm just going to use a sub D rectangle. And we're going to use a point count of one and one. And we're just going to click and drag a square out here. Now, this is its smooth shape. This is this is smooth mode. If I hit the tab key, you'll see it switches to box mode. And now we're actually seeing the square that I was referring to. Um, we've got a couple of new controls in in version six and version seven, um, which are sub D or uh, sub object selection tools, and those are accessed by holding down shift and control. And these are really important for moving quickly in sub D because shift control, if you just click the object you get the entire object if i shift control click i can pick an edge or if i shift shift control drag a corner i can get a vertex and this is super useful because it allows you to be able to just work within the scope of this this particular object instead of having to go all over your screen and try and hunt for navigation aids and things like that that in combination with gumball allows you to be able to move really quickly and so let's just let's just start and what i'm going to do is i'm going to just draw my first square and I'm going to kind of pull it vaguely into the shape of the front of my seat and then I'm going to just shift control click an edge and I'm going to use this extrude dot on gumball and I'm just going to pull out another square and I'm going to pull it to about here shift control drag pull down to here shift control click extrude drag, pull my shapes around a little bit, and somewhere in here, eh, maybe we'll add one more edge. 
And the way that I'm thinking about this is I'm thinking about where things are going to bend. And I like to refer to this as rule of three. And everything that we need to know about rule of three comes from everything we already know about drawing curves. So if I'm going to put a corner in a curve, the corner is made up of three points, right? If I turn my points on here, I've got three points here that make up a corner. If I want the corner to go outside, this center point goes outside. If I want it to go inside, I pull it inside. Same three points make the corner. And in, in this particular shape, we can see that we have an outside corner, an inside corner, an outside corner, and those are made up of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So everything we know about bending shapes and making corners, we already know because we know how to use NURBS curves. If we replace the word point with edge or vertex, we can start to put together a plan and say, okay, this is an outside corner right here. So clearly I'm going to need three points. One, two, three. If it's going to be an outside corner, this point comes up. If it's going to be an inside corner, this point goes down. In this case, it's an outside corner. So I'm going to place it right about there. And so this gives us everything that we need to know as far as controlling the shape. Does it go in? Does it go out? Does it go in, out, in, out, in, out? It's all just groups of three and how you organize them. If you need something that's going to be a very tight shape, we can do things like add an edge, and I can add an edge here and add an edge here. Now I've got three points again, right, right here. And this shape now has more control to go in or out and be sharper. But it's the same concept, the same three points. And this shape here is controlled by these three points. So the tightness or looseness of this corner is going to be determined by how far or, or how close these three points are. These three points are close. This is going to be a sharp transition. These two points are close, and this point is pretty far away. So this transition up here is going to be sharper than this transition down here. If I needed it to be sharper, I'd simply add another edge. So now I have these three points, and this transition is then controllable in a much sharper way. So now that we know the basics behind that, then we can start laying things out in, in a very kind of logical way. And you can see on the front of this shape that, that I'm actually missing a little bit of crown on this because I've only got two points, right? So if I grab this edge here and I add an edge in the center, I now have the ability to be able to control my topology in a way where I can then have three points in the front view which allows me to be able to control my crown, not only in my side view here, right? This has crown going this way. But if I grab this, this entire edge and I go to the perspective view, it also allows me to be able to control my crown this way. And if I switch to shaded mode and I switch this to smooth, you can see that is where that control starts to happen. So once we understand those basics, then we can do things like start to lay this out in a very kind of common sense way. And this technique I like to refer to is called paper doll. And the idea behind it is we're taking something very, very, very simple and we're laying it out flat. And then we're going to take that shape and we're going to bend it into shape and then we're going to connect it to something else to get a shape that's that's much more complex than than what we originally had. So let's start out with a single sub D face and let's start, start laying out the back here. And so I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna click four points. I'm gonna place my first face. And then I'm gonna oops, place my first point. And then shift control click, I'm gonna extrude. And then I'm gonna grab the seaplane waffle, I'm going to start dragging, but I'm going to hold control. And then I'm just going to very quickly basically lay out kind of what my seat shape is supposed to be like. And then I'm going to go back and start pulling points to put them at logical places where my transitions are. 
and then look at it and say, does this capture the basic intent or the basic shape of what I'm trying to do here? And in this case, I would say yes. Um, I need a little bit more shape back here. Probably pull this a little bit. But just that alone gives me the basis for what I need to do in order to create the seat. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click here. I need to have some crown down this. I've only got two points. So I'm going to add an edge. And then I'm going to decide how I want that spine to flow. And in this case, I think I want it to have, think of, you can almost think about this, like where would the highlight line be or where would the break for this surface be? And with those two pieces de developed, and then I can pull this edge out just a little bit to define that crown already, I can start thinking about what happens to the seat. So let's go now to the front view. And I can pull this over. And I can start bending this to match my front profile. Nothing hard here yet. This is all, this is all simple stuff. Okay, so that gives me the basic profile of my seat back. Maybe this edge follows more like that. Same thing here, I'm gonna pull this guy out. I'm gonna just flatten this for now so that I can keep it straight. I'm also gonna isolate so it's the only thing I'm worried about. And I'm gonna grab this entire thing and I'm actually gonna run a bend deformer on this and bend this procedurally and just go burp. And it's gonna take and just beautifully distribute all of my seat edges. Whoa, don't want that one, sorry. And allows me to be able to place this in space in a very simple manner. And let's see, my file organization is failing me here. All right, let me just get this back. There we go. I'm going to put these on a new layer. Bring this back and we're going to just turn this layer on only. There we go. All right, where were we? Let's grab this and bend it. And we have the basis of our seat side laid out already. Now we can start doing deciding things like, does this spine come in or out? I would say it probably comes out a little bit. Does this spine come in or out? I would say it comes out a little bit. And then we can simply take these two pieces and mirror them. And now we've got two copies of this, all right? Nothing complicated so far, right? Now we're gonna just take this edge and this edge, and then I'm gonna bridge. And we're just gonna connect these together. And again, I've only got two points, which means I don't have any control in the center, which means I don't have any ability to be able to add crown there. I also don't have a center point. So I'm going to add another edge, and I'm just going to call that good. Same thing here. I'm going to take this edge and this edge, this edge and this edge, and I'm going to bridge this again. Remembers my settings, so I'm just going to let it join up. And you can see already we've got the basis a seat. In fact, we can even decide maybe we want to connect these and create our seat bucket. If I switch to shaded mode or I switch to uh, shaded mode, you can see this form has already started to develop. Now, experienced NURBS folks out there, look at this corner. These type of corners are just diabolically difficult in order to be able to pull off in NURBS. Whereas in here, it just happens. You just get it for free. 
So how do we go about adding the seat, the filler on this? We've got the shell. Well, that's a simple matter of just coming through here and picking this and saying sub D offset sub D. I'm going to flip it so it, sub, so it goes in and I'm going to change the, the distance to something. We'll, we'll try five units and see what it looks like. That's clearly a little heavy. So let's go 0.25. That's a little light. So let's do, let's just do one. And that's probably still a little heavy. And that gives us this. All I have to do to soften this out is double click this edge and remove this crease. And I've got the basis for my seat already. So I can do the same thing down here. My settings are probably correct for the bottom, so it's going to remember those. I'm just going to run it, double click, remove the crease. And I've got the basis for everything that I need to do going forward. If I want to make a headrest for this, I can take these two edges, start pulling them, tap Alt, and I'm going to just copy those. And that gives me everything I need now to just start extruding out some additional faces if I wanted to do a headrest. Nothing hard yet? Starting to kind of see what we're looking at here? I can close this up by just bridging these two edges together. And then I don't have an edge here. That's why that didn't join, so let's redo it. I always like to say I make the mistakes so you don't have to. And that joins into our headrest, which gives us the basis for what we would need to do if we were to you know, start sculpting a headrest or anything like that. So let's grab, let's add a little bit more detail in here, and I'm going to select a ring. And then I'm going to just add another edge because I've only got two points, right? So I can't really control this. So let's add an intermediate point. I'm going to snap it to the middle. And now that gives me the ability to be able to use the scale and control whether this crowns in or out or how sharp it is. I can do things like grab this edge. If I want this to be sharp, I could bevel it. And then I can actually remove these creases because I've added enough edges to get control, right? I've got three points to make my to make my corner. So let's remove the crease. And you can see that this is starting to develop with a really nice blend of sharp features and soft features. I can start doing things like this. And I can start iterating to say, okay, well, what does this start to look like? Is this smooth here? Does it perhaps have some cushions that come out of this where I'm just going to pull these out? And I'm going to pull these out in two, in two different phases because I didn't want them all to pull out. I wanted them to pull out individually. So I'm going to pull out the first two and the second two. And that gives me the ability to be able to control any type of quilting or cushioning or anything like that. All right. I can do things like I can connect surfaces together. Like say, for instance, I wanted to connect these two faces. Say this wasn't a separate headrest. Say this was a, uh, an integrated headrest. I can bridge two faces together. And give myself something that looks like that. I can also remove an edge if there's too much detail somewhere and soften a form dramatically. The thing about the sub D system that, that we have built is it's very, 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 very durable. <laughs> and I I laugh every time I say that because I, I proved this in public at a demo for one of our larger customers by taking the model and twisting it. Actually, let's do it this way.
twisting it once would be impressive, right? Twisting it twice is kind of crazy. I took a I took an architectural model that had a couple of hundred faces in it. And as I was talking, I just started doing this. And I just kept going and going and going and going and going and going and going to the point where it was absolutely positively absurd, right? But not only does Rhino do it, but this sub D is still usable. I can still model on this. Okay. I would never do it, but I just use this as an example to say this did not break. This is still an absolutely 100% viable piece of geometry. In fact, I can mirror this, go over here, and I could bridge these two these two pieces together. Right. And I could just keep going, even though this is an utter disaster. Well, if we don't like that utter disaster, we're just going to back out of it and we're right back to where we were. So these tools are, uh, I like to say, fairly robust. <laughs> if we wanted to blow a hole in this model, I'm going to throw a few more edges in here and I'm going to use the both sides. I'm going to just pull this out, something like that. And then I'm going to do one more over here. And then I'm going to take this face and this face, and I'm going to bridge these together. If you bridge together two closed objects, you bridge through it, it makes a hole, which allows you to be able to do all sorts of interesting things, like build little seatbelt vents and things like that. So this is the basis of, of, of the sub D system, right? We're starting with squares. We're modeling something flat. We're using tools we already know how to use, like bend and twist and moving points and gumball. And then we're just connecting them together using bridge. Think of bridge like BlendSurf, right? Everybody knows how to use BlendSurf. It's one of my favorite tools in the entire Rhino toolbox. And and bridge is now basically your your sub D, your sub D, you know, BlendSurf. And so I don't usually like to do this. Um, I, we refer to these as Julia Child's demos where I mix a couple of ingredients together and then I pull the finished thing out of the oven, but we have a time limitation today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna permit myself that luxury for today. And this basically, this model, basically, if you go down the road a little bit, ends up looking something like this. And if we go to rendered mode, and we were to apply some materials to it, you can see that you can actually get some really kind of delightfully wonderful forms out of this without much more effort than what I've shown here already. If you look at the wireframe on this particular model, and this one actually was converted to NURBS already, but um, if, if you were to look at the wireframe on this, all of the transitions follow that same rule of three, right? This this form on the back here is simply created by taking this edge adding some additional detail to it let's add an edge on both sides and then pulling this form in a little bit and now we start to be able to create details in this in a way that are really pretty lovely. And if I don't want this additional second crown in here, I'll just delete that edge. And now I've got the basis of my, of my seat definition going in there, right? So we've been modeling for what, 15, 20 minutes right now? And we've already got something that we could start to play with. We could put a, a figure in here and start to refine fits. We could start to refine the bolsters and the shoulder fits and where the head and everything were to hit on this. We could refine where the seat belt holes are. We could also decide whether we like this type of cushioning or not. If we don't, we just simply take it out, right? We would just knit this stuff back up. We just connect these two edges back together simply by just going from here to here. Stitch these edges together. Stitch these edges together. E 
even in situations where the geometry starts to get tortured, you see it doesn't fall apart. The system doesn't break, which allows you to be able to just go exploring without worrying too much about whether the model's going to come to part, come come apart. So, so in this particular piece right here, if we if we switch over to this guy, and we say here to finish this up. I've added some materials that we've also added as a new feature in version seven, which is substance materials. So if I look at my, sub, my, my material list here, we've added the, the ability to work with Adobe Substance. And in this case, I went to Substance Source, found some really lovely uh, leather textures, and then applied those Ooh. onto here and was able to you know, try a bunch of different color combinations and, and you know, CFD kind of, things to in order to to be able to refine the look that I was looking for. I also applied projected some curves onto the surface and then applied a line type to them and then piped that line type in order to be able to create my stitching. And then I actually copied that curve, the secondary blue curve down here. I used a uh, a curve uh, or the um the the panel split tool. And I stuck those two things on top of each other. And if we switch to ray trace mode, you can see that those two are both render mesh effectors. And it allows you to get a very convincing seam with just a couple of projected curves and a few settings. And if we back out of this, you can see that it looks fairly realistic. I'm going to shut my surface edges off and let the image develop with the real-time ray, ray tracing engine that's built into 7. So that's kind of an overview of how to start from just a single square and end up with a shape like this. As long as you understand that concept of using groups of three in order to turn corners, you can take very very simple topology and very simple layout and develop it into something in a fairly short amount of time i probably have maybe an hour and a half into this model but you can see from the from the development that we did to start with how you could get there so with that uh we can open up the questions and uh and go from there Thank you, Carl. Nice presentation. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think both Steph and I are going to help with uh, sort of uh, the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, uh, so I, I, right. Yes. Good. Alex is there too. I uh, just a quick question. F well, actually, let's let's not start there. Um, <laughs> questions perhaps related directly to what we've just seen let's start with that uh because i there's some that want to uh go back to some of your presentation alex so perhaps we'll do that a little later um so let's stay with what we've just seen um i know steph you mentioned you had a couple that related yeah. i think directly to this yeah i do um so there's one here from uh daniel and the question is, um, are there any plans to introduce X and Y symmetry into sub D? Um, currently, the reflect command only allows one axis. Maybe that's one for you, Scott. Well, Kyle can answer that. I, I think at the time um, we're working on uh, reflect was the first iteration on, on symmetry, and we wanted to get that working and robust. Um, I think that is well underway to the point where we're, we've set it loose in the wild and are letting users um, uh, use it in ways that, that we might not necessarily have had planned. And when those edge cases start to come up, then we go back and refine the tool to try and, uh, to try and you know, really make it as bulletproof as we possibly can. So I think Reflect as it sits right now is is just single access 
Um, you can obviously reflect and then mirror with history, and you would essentially get de facto four axis symmetry. Um, the next part of the plan for symmetry is to get radial symmetry working. And right now we have a command called radiate. Um, which allows you to do radial symmetry. Um, again, it's the first iteration on that tool, and so there's a lot of work to be done to, to fill in all the blanks of situations that we hadn't planned um, and, and refine on that. So is, um, is, that, it, is that about, in seven? Is that in seven or is that in eight? That's in seven. It's here, okay. it's here now. Um, so you can so, type in radiate on the command line. Would yeah, you be like seven six? Yeah. And so for now, um, I would consider this to be to be you know version one of of um, symmetry. But the the thing you have to remember is now sub D is now a full featured um, you know full full privileged citizen of the Rhino development platform at this point. And so this is this is only version you know V point five of sub D. It's going to continue to develop just as the rest of the Rhino tools have developed. And so, as we as we get more information from users, and as more people use it, and as more cases develop, and and things like that, um, you know, this this tool is going to continue to mature and grow in in ways that, you know, we may have planned and we may not have planned, depending on what the what users um, are are requesting and asking for. So. Great, thanks, Carl. Paul, there's a question from um, Ben, I think. Yeah, the question from Ben is: uh, If you convert to NURBS, does the re does does the re uh, does the retain the clean causal? Yeah, translate that one yeah. for me. So yeah, it's about retaining yeah. clean corners after yeah. you convert you convert to NURBS. How uh, you yeah, talking about particularly on the bottom section that you were showing? Yeah. Um, so the the answer to that is yes. What you see in sub D is what you get in NURBS. It's a direct one to one translation. There's no data loss between the two. Right. And then Thanks, and. And when you convert to when you convert to NURBS, there's a, a an option to pack the NURB surfaces into larger patches. So we'll we'll do that where possible. Yeah. Um, that's why when you see that seat, um, you know you might, for instance, in the highly curved uh, or the complicated areas, you may still have a lot of patches, but in the larger areas, you'll have a lot fewer NURBS patches. But it's still a one-to-one -one correspondence to the sub D shape. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, another question here. This one is from Joe. Um, are there any plans to introduce the fuse command that Daniel Piker showed on the Discord? Yeah, there are plans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a very highly requested feature. Daniel is definitely under the microscope on that one. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's harder than you can believe, even though Dan's Daniel's already done it. And so people that don't know what fuse command is, you can take it's like real time boolean for for sub D objects. You can throw them together and they fuse together into one. Um, and he's shown some of that on our discourse forum, and so you can take a look at that. Uh, but I don't know when it's actually going to get in Rhino itself. And it's and it's an actual boolean. It's not a it's not a display trick that that then bakes later. It it actually is doing what you see on the screen, like meta balls and things like that um, that you may have seen with other software. It's um it's a uh, it's a display trick, and then you actually have to go and bake it, and it makes the calculation then at a later date. Daniel's fuse is basically you take two things and you mush them together, and they actually fuse together. It's kind of amazing. It so it'll show up in Grasshopper first, um, and I believe it actually that's its, its current form. Um, if you check the forum, he's got some he's got some code out there that you can actually try and play with. But um, um, that that is definitely something that everybody is looking at him, tapping their feet, going, "When is it coming?" <laughs> Myself included. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So 
uh, somebody just Rick quickly asked about there being a recording. So yeah, there will be a recording of this um, available. We'll send it out afterwards, and it will go on to our YouTube channel. So yeah, as soon as uh, we can. Paul, yeah. Paul, yeah, then if you want to ask that question for Alex. Yeah, there's a few. I mean, um, Alex, um, I think perhaps this is asked on behalf of you know most of the audience, which are kind of like you, you know, uh, users of Rhino pre sub D wondering what would this have changed for you? You know, perhaps seeing these tools now, uh, your approach is, would it have changed anything for you? You know, if you'd have had access to V7, you know, you know, earlier, it, I guess it, the it, questions it, it, relates to, you know, how much, how interesting is this for you? I suppose, uh, and, and uh, your your workflow to this point. Yeah. So, uh, truth be told, we we were actually working with uh, the work in progress V7. Um, we were playing around with it at the time when this project came about. So, uh, during the pandemic, when we had a, a few of the guys on furlough. Um, you know, we task them with, you know, you, you jump into sub D and you just check it out, see what you can do um, and use this project. This is a non-commercial project. Use it as a bit of an analog uh, to see whether you can build the kind of forms that will, you know, eventually, you know, develop. And, uh, you know, we actually worked with Phil Cook, uh, who jumped on and gave us a little bit of sub D training uh, to, to get us started. And, um, I think the thing to be said about um, the application of sub D in the automotive industry is that the automotive industry likes to contradict itself a little bit in that it wants to be fast, it wants to be agile, and it wants to be seen as being the most progressive of all the industries. Um, but at the same time, they're obsessed with control. So in terms of getting to the end, the end goal of, of having you know, a, a CAD that you can then take out and manufacture. Um, at the moment, that has to be NURBS. You you just can't get that level of control with anything other than NURBS. Um, but that doesn't preclude sub D from having a valuable place in the work process, but we see it all at the front end. We see it at really early on conceptual stage. You've got an engineering package, you're form finding, you really want to do quick iterations um, for, that kind of process, if you're proficient in sub D, I think it could be immensely useful and it's something we continually reevaluate here in the studio because uh, we think it's the future, definitely of that that early concept stage stuff. But I think the first thing that Scott said when he introduced you know, this, this session on sub D was that you have to think differently. And that, that's a really difficult thing to do when the industry, the automotive industry is built entirely around NURBS. You know, it's got a massive contractor uh, industry where everyone's using NURBS modelers. And um, to change how you think about modeling is is not particularly easy, especially for guys who've been doing it, you know, years and years and years. And I think that's the, that's the hurdle we have to get over to really start using it uh, in earnest in our commercial projects is we need the guys to be up to speed um with doing this as as quickly as kind of the demonstrations promise you know getting to those quick closed body forms uh quickly and um but we always see the processes doing that using that potentially in some visualization photoshopping over the top to kind of like fill in the blanks um but when it comes to like a a design theme when i can pretty much guarantee that we'll probably take it into NURBS, we'll probably convert it to NURBS, run sections through it, start to think about our patch layout. One of the skills of an automotive modeler is is looking at what to anyone else looks like an immensely complicated form and seeing a patch layout. And uh, it's a skill that you only get with experience and that skill has to be relearned if you're gonna go sub D. So I think that's something that, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna try and learn use it at the front end and then run sections through, build a wireframe and the selected proposals will then continue the refinement in NURBS. Okay, yeah, 
for your answer. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, it's quite a, a detailed kind of specific question for you, Alex. Um, with such complex models, do you find use for work sessions to keep file size down, enable enabling reference parts to be visible, but not making uh, working file size so high and slow to load? Is this uh, again part uh, of your? The short answer to that is uh, no. We don't use work sessions at the moment. Uh, we do sometimes use block references. Uh, particularly if we've got a, a heavy piece of engineering cut that's come from a partner that might have details in it that we don't often need to, to delve into. Um, we did that more on uh, the previous book project where we designed a, a 16 ton truck. Within a truck, there's so many systems. Um, it's immensely complicated to keep all of that um, in a single uh, a Rhino file. Uh, so we use block instances um, a few times on that as as references. Um, but generally, I'm I'm the kind of person who likes to be able to access anything at any time. So I um, I just make sure I've got an incredibly powerful machine, and I I try to keep as much in the file as possible. Um, one thing we find speeds things up is uh, sometimes we do save small if we're worried about disk space, uh, and sometimes we will drop the render mesh quality if we start to see it struggling but you know if it's not displayed on the screen it, it's snappy so you know when we're developing surfaces you know so long as we know our constraints we'll we'll turn the layers with all the engineering detail off and and we'll just work through a problem and then we'll keep everything in the file so that um yeah we we always have that reference that we can jump back to immediately i think it's fair to say that when we break out like individual tasks you know, we might, you know, define the package, uh, define, define the A surfaces as, as a whole with everything included, but then we'll like break certain parts out and give it to a designer and say, look, you're going to work through this, you're going to do the B side, you're going to do all the details. We'll take parts out selectively. Um, it'll keep the same layer structure. So everything will kind of like go between files um, without contradiction. And, um, and then they'll be able to work within that working layer do the changes they want to do and then when they're ready to commit something to like the master working file or the master golden tree that we use for manufacturing you know it'll go through a review process and then we'll, we'll drop it in it's actually one of the benefits of having an enormous file is it generally only not many people in the studio will have a big enough computer to to uh, open it and handle it and that stops people dropping in rogue pieces of cad that you uh you haven't managed to check so it uh, can be advantageous to have a massive file <laughs> Yeah, find the silver lining somewhere. Mm. Mm. Um, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, and thanks, uh, John, for that question. Um, so, I don't know, I think Phil may have some things to bring up for Kyle, uh, I believe, or has we have we covered some of those points, Phil? Uh, we've covered... It some i think it was it was maybe scott as well i was just when before somebody was asking a, a, one of the questions was what sort of features would you like to see and one of the things that um i've been asked about a number of times and i'm not really sure whether it's a valid question but uh, one of the questions is when we go through the commands and we show sweep one rail sweep two rail we always get asked is there a sweep three rail or is there a way of, you know, controlling a kind of a surface with with more than two rails? And obviously, network surface doesn't really kind of uh, fit the bill because of the fact that it's always fitted. Um, so I guess that's one thing that that um, because we, we we get asked it quite a lot. Um, I guess I should maybe ask Scott or Kyle if there's any thoughts of any new type of ways of, of building surfaces in 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 rhino because the you know the um the sweep and 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 loft and the other commands have remained essentially the same for for a while now hmm. 
I believe what happens is is once you start introducing the third rail, you start fitting anyway, and unless it's perfect, unless the inputs are perfect. Mm. And so, so I, I I I believe that that I mean, I guess you could special case. Yeah, I we don't have anything that I know of that 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 we've been working on for that case only because you do start getting into requirements of the of the inputs have to get awfully clean in order to to you know to get it to work in that one situation where like network surf doesn't care you know it you can miss all the curves can miss each other and it still will do something um and so but but you're right they you know then you get into the whole question of you know if you want to control uh structure uh going one direction because of course the sweeps are going to fit in the other direction anyway but um yeah it's it's not something that i know of that we have on the list although you know again keep asking for those things um and maybe maybe somebody will come up with something but i i i believe the math says you have to that they have to really match to work mm. so i think that's true okay know, kyle, thank you kyle, yeah kyle might have another understanding of it but That's my understanding as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's great. Um, well, I, we are a little over time, um, a little fifteen minutes over time, perhaps. So we there's um, hmm. so maybe we should um, uh, end now. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, if there's any questions that haven't been answered, we will always get back to you by uh, uh, email. And um, you do have the recordings to refer to. Um, I, th Yeah, okay. So um, I just want to um, thank you, um, Alex and Carsten. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Fantastic presentation. So, uh, thank you. Re really, really good. Um, Scott and Carl, thanks so much for your time uh, uh, input. Fantastic, great demonstration there from Carl. I think uh, I dread to think what that hour and twenty minutes presentation would have taken you in Rhino Six. Could you? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> gonna, I'm not even going to ask you to guess. Um, let's just uh, leave it at that. You can do it. It just would have been a lot more painful. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm. And I don't think we'd have organized a demo of that somehow, not live anyway. Yeah, um, I, I, I just just really quickly on there, though, I think that's an important point, is that that even if you would have taken that problem on with NURBS, you would have designed that seat before you approached it. Like you would have designed it in detail before you approached it, because once you put it together, it was stuck. Where Where I know Kyle... You know, now we can approach that. You don't. You actually don't know what the seat's going to look like. You just know it's a seat, and you can yeah. you can work the sub D while you're deciding and understanding, and 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 that's a huge difference in terms yeah. of the way you might even do it. I refer. To, yeah, I refer to sub D as the best possible tool for finding the way along the way. You know, if you're just searching, it's like it's it's almost it's almost fast and flexible enough and i would say in the right hands it is fast and flexible enough to sketch in it where you can just start down a path without an idea and see where it leads and you can push and pull your way into something that you might not have necessarily planned on on finding and yet it reveals itself because of the flexibility and the ease and the speed of being able to do this so um, I've started demos where I had one design in mind and noticed some little spark along the way of some little shape or a, a little knife of light or something that showed up that just sparked a completely different path. And I've ended up in a place that is significantly more delightful than what I had had planned. And yet I would have never ended up there without the without being able to start down that path and use these tools and basically just bump my way into something that that was better than I was planning. So I, I find that 
often when I'm, especially when I'm doing testing or whether I'm just doodling around in it, um, is I'll end up someplace where I was like, holy smokes, where'd that come from? And I would have never found that in NURBS because it just isn't flexible enough in order to be able to do that type of searching. Great, thanks, Carl. Um, really good. We're just getting lots of messages saying thank you so much for the presentations, for the demo. So um, great, guys. Thanks so much. Um, I just need to, before I forget, put this onto this slide here, and um, uh, you know, just uh, thank everybody, but also uh, mention that we do have the next meeting lined up for the 24th of June. Um, we're back to a sort of AEC um, uh, focus on this meeting with Foster and Partners. Um, Martha's going to be presenting, telling us. Uh, something about their experiences with Rhino in the Omniverse. Now, that will mean uh, something to some of you. Um, but if you want to understand more about that, you're very welcome to join us on the 24th of June. Um, it's not announced yet. There's no more information on our website about this, but there will be perhaps early next week. Um, so um, I think that's all. Is, have I forgotten anything, Steph? No. Great. All That's good. a first. That's a first. Great. Um, so thanks, everybody. Um, have a nice evening. Nice rest of the day. See you next time. Thanks all for joining Bye. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.